Welcome back to another video. So today I'm going to be showing you how to solo Throne of Thunder up to Jikun for the clutch of Jikun Mount. Now, not all of this is particularly easy to do, especially the Council of Elders, and success will definitely vary by class. Maybe the Blood DKs and Hunters will have an easy enough time here, but some of the rest may have troubles and may need to wait a raid tier or two worth of gear until some of this stuff is doable. Now, I did previously do a video in Throne of Thunder which covered how to solo up to Horridon to get the mount off him, and I will plaster a link to that somewhere in the um, annotation or maybe in the description. With all that covered though, let's get right into the soloing. All right, so first of all, let's tackle the council. Now, this is probably the hardest fight in here so far, and the main tactic here is to, first of all, nuke the crap out of Frost King Malak, because he does this thing called Biting Cold, which will basically just kill you. The good news is, though, that basically will never be a problem, because you'll kill him before he casts it, which is a really good thing. Now, you just saw that the sand guy put a sand trap under me, and I um, actually broke out of that. That's essentially a root. It roots you in place and does damage to you. So what you want to do is use something like, say, Post Haste on a Hunter, which is one of your talents, to break out of it. So if you're going to do this fight, you'll need a way to break out of a root. Now, you just seen Marley sent a kind of lower spirit thingy over to the guy that I'm fighting right now, and it healed him up. You do want to and basically just intercept them and kill them before they actually reach their target. I just kind of messed up. There you can see me breaking out of one of those traps. It's uh, really an easy enough mechanic to deal with. You can also see Sol throw these little bolts around the place and essentially just keep on moving because they do damage in a radius, so if you keep on moving, they'll never ever hit you. As for the other guys, um, well, actually the main like mechanic here is um, they sort of get empowered and then when you take off 25% of their health, they lose their empowerment and the empowerment goes on to another boss. Now, Malak's empowerment is never an issue because you kill him so quickly. Sol's is just not much of a problem anyway, you don't need to worry about it. Um, Marley's basically means that instead of summoning a healing beast, she summons one that kills you if it touches you, so you just want to not get touched by it. And then Kazrajin's empowerment, which he's the big jumpy dude, it just makes him do a kind of lightning storm, which does a big lot of AoE damage that you certainly do want to watch out for. Now, in this attempt here, you can see that I get killed, I was silly, and I only recorded... <laughs> Um, the last half. I forgot that I wasn't recording halfway through my kill, so I'm going to jump to that pretty soon. Um, but you can see here that what actually killed me mostly was the lack of self-healing or anything like that. So what actually got me the kill was switching over and using a spirit beast hunter pet. It's basically, if you're not a hunter, it's a pet that's got an ability which gives you a heal every 30 seconds, and that is essentially what made me win this fight. So there you go, I've just died, and now we're into the actual attempt. And you can see here, I've already killed Frost King, and then I killed Zul, and both Marley and Kazrajin are at around half health. So at this stage, it really is a very easy fight. The only issue is the damage that comes out from Overload from Kazrajin when he's empowered. So you want to make sure that whenever he gets empowered, you just deal that 25% of his health to him to stop the empowerment, because his empowerment's just not very nice. Now, moving on to Marley. There you go, she just did another Spirit Beast thingy, which I, of course, did not destroy in time, because I'm great. Um, <laughs> but yeah, her um, her main ability, actually, is just the nuke that she does on you, so if you can interrupt that from time to time, it's totally worth doing. You can see here, things definitely did get pretty close for me, and in general, for classes which don't have a lot of self-healing, like, say, a Hunter, this isn't the best fight. I'd say that maybe a Blood DK would do extremely well here because of their absolutely ridiculously good self-healing. So if you look at her um, casting bar, you can see that she um, is casting Wrath of the Loa. That's just her nuke. It's not really much of a problem, though, and uh, that's essentially the fight dead. So in summary, nuke down the um, Frost King Malak, keep on moving, then use a way to, you know, like a root break to get out of the sand traps, and uh, hope that you've got enough sustain to last throughout the fight, or enough DPS to get it down quickly. Next, we're here on Tortos, and the good news is, Tortos is a very, very easy guy to kill. He is really not much of a problem at all, at least in my experience. I don't know what he's like if you're actually a class that's getting whacked by him. Now, um, essentially what he does throughout the fight is he sort of, you know, noms in your pet slash noms in you, drops things from the floor, just don't get hit by them. You can see right now that because I'm BM with the 2 piece set bonus and all that stuff, I've got really good burst damage, so I'm able to get him down to half health very quickly. Now, he does summon these turtle dudes, and 
I decided to kill them because they're just a pain in the ass. I don't really know if you need to or not. Um, he does do an, a breath, an ability called a Furious Stone Breath, which he just did. Now, the way that you want to avoid Furious Stone Breath is essentially when you kill these turtles, they stop and they start spinning on the floor. You then click on one of them and you can see your extra action button allows you, it, you basically punt it in a direction. You'll see me do it again in this fight. Now, I don't actually know, actually, here I am. So you click on it, then you click the extra action button on it, you'll just kick it in that direction. And that will interrupt his Furious Stone Breath. But I don't actually know if you need to do that. I never really waited long enough to find out. Though I do suspect that it probably doesn't do a terribly dangerous amount of damage at our gear level. Really, you can just, you know, nuke this guy down. He's not a problem. Now, next, we've got Megara. And Megara, I've heard people report that she's kind of tricky, but I didn't find it to be too bad. First of all, don't use your big cooldowns at the start of the fight. Essentially, the way she works is when you kill one of her heads, she then, um, you know, disappears, does a rampage, which I'll cover in a bit, and then uh, more heads appear. And I think once you kill, like, seven of her heads, that's when the boss actually dies. So... The way that it works is that it gets progressively harder in terms of damage as you move on throughout the fight. So you want to save your big cooldowns for the final like one or two heads that you have to kill. So you can just see here, uh, see here I kill the head, then they slink away, and then two new ones appear. And she does a thing called Rampage. Rampage basically just throws damage everywhere. The initial few Rampages don't do that much damage, but... As time goes on, her rampages will deal more and more and more damage, to the point where the final rampage really does do a... a it's, it's not a trivial amount of damage anyway. So, uh, throughout this fight, the main strategy that I used was I either killed the green or the blue head. Basically, when you kill one of her heads, then all of them disappear and you get presented with a new set of two. Um, I killed the green and blue ones when I could, because when you kill the red one, it basically... You don't want to kill the red one because it activates an ability and stuff happens, so just kill green and blue. Now, throughout the rest of the fight, um, after her rampage, she then just goes on to doing regular abilities with her heads. Depending on your burst damage, you probably won't have to deal with it that much, but her abilities are really quite simple. There's one thing called Cinders, which just puts a dot on you whenever that uh, dot is dispelled, a pool of fire drops on the floor. Not really a great deal you can do about that, honestly. There's the Ice Torrent. Um, basically, it drops a torrent of ice, which leaves crap on the floor, don't stand in any of that, pretty simple. And the ability that the green head has is basically a big green swirly circle, which will appear on the ground, and, um... Wow, did I, did I really stand on that? That was very silly of me. Yeah, it's a big uh, green swirly thing, and basically, the further away you are from the swirly, the less damage it will do to you. Really, it's not a very hard fight, in my experience, you just need to be sure to save your big cooldowns and, you know, health regen things for later on in the fight. Now, one thing that was quite useful to me is I do have a Spirit Beast, and its heal was very useful for the latter parts of the fight. If you don't have a Spirit Beast as a hunter, then you may not have the sustain to last through the entire fight. Can't say 100% for sure, but you'll just have to uh, play it by ear, I suppose. Now, the heads do a tank, uh, sort of a breath thingy. Usually what would happen in the actual raid is the tank would just aim the head away so it never breathed on the raid. Um, so ideally, what you want to do is just try to not get hit by the breath. Obviously, if you're, say, a death knight, well, there's not a terrible amount that you can do about that, and you'll just have to take the damage. There's the green swirly thing. You don't want to be near those. As you can see, I avoided it and didn't really take that much damage. Overall damage, not too much of an issue here. And now we are on to the final set of heads and the very final rampage of the fight. Um, so this is when I'm taking the most damage, so you can sort of use the damage that's going onto my character to gauge your own survivability here. And essentially, I just popped uh, Stampede and killed her. That was pretty much it for this fight. I didn't read up much into it or come up with a, a crazy strategy or anything. I just did this in my second attempt, so it was really all quite easy. And next, we've got G Kun, who is the guy you want to kill for the mount. And I've got some excellent news about G Kun. He's really, really easy to kill. He's like by far the easiest boss in here so far, and in my experience. So, in terms of abilities, there's really not that much you have to look out for. Now, if you are a tank, he does do a you know tank debuff and various things like that. So, if you're taking melee hits from him, you'll just have to deal with that with whatever way your class is equipped. Um, as for the hunter perspective, though. He whacks your pet, and you just sort of stand there and kill him. And that really is it. Now, back in the actual raid, there was a mechanic where you would jump down off the platform that I'm currently on to various nests where you'd kill 
Jikun's hatchlings and things like that. You don't actually need to do that, though, when you're soloing it. it that's all fine. The uh, repercussions of not doing that are not particularly severe. And because, you know, we, we get through this fight so damn quick with the amount of DPS that we're doing in kind of modern levels of gear. Now, her abilities are... I mean, there's not that many. There's those blobby things which fall on the floor. Just don't stand in them. They were a lot of fun to deal with back in patch 5.2, but don't stand in them. There's also a thing called Kaw, which is just an AoE, which may or may not hit you. It's, it's again, not really a problem. Uh, there's also Quills, which is happening right now. This used to do a lot of damage back in the day, and right now it doesn't do that much damage. And then there's also an ability called Backdraft, which you'll see in a few seconds. Basically, a bunch of wind pushes you off the platform. Um, if you do get pushed off and you're the only- and there's like, there's no one else there on the platform, I don't know if uh, the boss despawns or not. No idea about that. Um, but for me, as, as a hunter, it's very easy to not be pushed off, so there you go, downdraft is happening. All I do is just disengage, and the speed boost from the end of disengage means that, uh, really, it's not much of a problem, and the boss is dead very soon afterwards. It uh, really wasn't too hard to solo this whole part of the instance, apart from the Council of Elders. The Council is, in my opinion, by far the hardest thing so far in Throne of Thunder, and it might take you quite a while. You know, for me, I had flasks, I had food, and um, I actually I didn't use my augment rune. I was going to though, um, and really, what did it for me was the extra sustain from my pet. Because what would have killed me in council was just generally the passive damage that was doled out. So once I got that pet, that was really it. Fine, and that's basically it for this video. That's the soloing. You will probably need good gear um, to do some of this stuff. You know, the, the more the merrier, honestly. And for some classes, it just will not be feasible until later on. That's generally the way things go. You find that the Hunters and the DKs and some of the other tank classes and the Paladins and things like that are great at soloing. And then because of mechanics, it just takes a few raid tiers for the others to catch up. So I hope that um, you've got some sort of character that can get this. And good luck farming the mount. You'll most certainly need it because raid mounts are quite a rarity. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.